Sorry, I was listening to music. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. It is the June Pen Parentis Literary Salon, and we are so glad that you are here. And please, you know what to do. You write down, you know, hi in the comments. And if you do that, then we can see that you are there. Whether you are on YouTube or Facebook watching us live, we are so glad that you took the time out of your day to do that. So thanks for doing that. This is the Pen Parentis June pop-up summer, summer madness, summer happiness, uh, better than usual beach books. Um, and I am M.M. DeVoe, and this is my glorious partner, Christina Chu, who is the curator for tonight's event. And before we get started, I would very much like to thank our sponsor for the third month in the row. The DeGroat Foundation has sponsored us, and we are so, so pleased. And I have a little message from Clyde at DeGroat. So if you would just listen for one second, Clyde DeGroat of the DeGroat Foundation would like to say thanks to everyone from Pen Parentis, that's you guys out there, who submitted a Courage to Write application. She says it was an honor to learn about so many exciting authors and writing projects. The selection committee, this is big news, you guys, the selection committee will choose a finalist pool of about 30 applicants by early next week. They will notify those 30 finalists as soon as they can. The actual seven grant awardees will be notified and announced in early July. And she has also asked that we please tell our audiences, you guys, that the DeGroat Foundation loves how Pen Parentis supports and encourages writers. That's us. We support and encourage writers. Um, so anybody who does not know us and who is new, um, we are a nonprofit. We are a 501c3, and we help writers stay on creative track after they have kids. That's what we do. We have salons, we have a fellowship, and we have a cycle of support. And I encourage you to go to penprentice.org to hear more about it and to make a donation so that we can keep going. And now let us hear about our fabulous authors from Christina Chu. Hello. <laughs> so we have three awesome readers tonight. Our first reader will be Leslie Gray Streeter. She authored the memoir, Black Widow. I love this title, so get it's ready. A good title. Black Widow, A Sad, Funny Journey Through Grief for people who normally avoid books with the word like journey in the title. <laughs> Our second reader will be Anne Leclerc. She's got 10 novels, most of which are best-selling. So she's going to be here. And finally, Matt Johnson, who is the recipient of the American Book Award and someone that Milda and I both know from Columbia. So Everyone, please welcome our, our authors. Welcome our authors. Now, while they bring them up, I want to say hi to Sandel Morse, who's out there. Hi from Portsmouth. Thank you for coming and reading for us before. Jennifer Pearl. Oh, hey, Jennifer. We have like, all these fabulous authors in the audience. Holy cow. Um, and oh, Finn Molding, that must be okay. Hey, Karen. <laughs> So Finn is performing in the theater. Her daughter is performing in the theater. Karen Molding's daughter is an actress. So anybody else who's out there, feel free to drop your names in the chat. We'll say hi to you. And in the meantime, let's keep going. Okay. So <laughs> Leslie Gray Streeter is the author, veteran journalist, and speaker whose memoir, Black Widow, a sad, funny journey to grief for people who normally avoid books with words like journey in the title, was published in March 2020. So she's a fellow like me. Um, until recently, she was longtime entertainment and lifestyle columnist and writer for the Palm Beach Post a native of Baltimore, Maryland, and oh, University Lord. of Maryland graduate. She and her work have been featured in the Miami Herald, the Washington Post, the Atlanta Journal, uh, Journal Constitution, the Atlantic, the Today Show, Cirrus XM, oh, the Oprah Magazine, you get the deal, everything. She lives with her son and her mother in Baltimore. Everyone, please welcome Leslie Street. Yay, Leslie. Thank you. And I have to say also, I am now a staff member of a columnist for a brand new publication that's all digital called The Baltimore Banner, which launched today. Yes, um, congratulations. Thank you. I wanted to ask you about this thing. You must tell us. All oh, my it. God. It's nonprofit. It's it's so funny because it's like I'm really excited about it. and I don't want to be too like it will save journalism, but maybe it will. I don't know. <laughs> it, it's, it's very local. It's very diverse as Baltimore is. It's very, we want, obviously we're going to tell the truth about things that are happening here. We also want it to be like, it's not just where the wire is, you know, it's, there's an art scene and awesome things. And I'm the columnist who's, my first column today was about how we did the survey that said all these people were like, we're going to leave. But then like 
the majority of people they asked if they were optimistic said they were. So it's, it's weird. It's a weird place. Um, and I'm, I'm proud to be here. Um, my book uh, was written while I lived in Florida, but I'm from Baltimore. I'm a, a native. Uh, my husband, who the book is about his death and the aftermath of which we met in high school. So even though I was living in, Bal in Florida at the time, it's a lot of Baltimore in this book. My son's name is Brooks Robinson, Streeter Servitz. Um, so you see the Cal Ripken painting behind me. So we're a very Oriole centric uh, household. And anybody that follows me on Twitter Shrewdest has seen. Cutest Twitter thing ever. Oh, oh my God. My God. <laughs> if you are not following Leslie, go on her Twitter and find this video of her son hitting a home run. Hold, you're going to cry. He's this little dude. He's like this tall. <laughs> and it, oh. Oh. And he did. What's so funny is he's like he's super intense. Like he actually watches. It's great because he used to watch a lot of like teens pranking each other on YouTube, and now he watches like baseball videos. So he goes outside because we're in a city. He swings in the alley, and he, so he goes there. And his coaches are like, "What's he doing?" I'm like, "That's his. He has a process. He's eight. So in the video, he just slam. He waits for his pitch, and then he slams it, and it's a, a grand slam. And he gives us a little like jump in the air i'm like whose child is this it's really funny <laughs> and they're all like high-fiving each other these little dudes and, and they're, they're so little there's there's two little girls nora and jubilee who are on the team who are my favorite honestly because they're really good and at one point you can see jubilee is stepping into what she thinks she's about to bat but the kids keep coming she has to move before she gets run over because eight-year-olds will run you over um yeah it was really fun um what uh, but my book as I said, uh, as the title will tell you, it was about the first year of my widowhood. And but it's not a, it, I wanted it to be a grief memoir that was about how people really feel about grief and not like this is the answer. This is how we feel. It also is very much about becoming a parent. Uh, my husband, Scott, and I were in the process of adopting a baby who is a relative of mine who is now was from the minute we met him, our son, we felt that way, but was not like yet legally. So we were in the process of adoption when Scott died. So the book is not just the mourning of him, but also trying to finish his adoption. My mother moves in as my co-parent. It's a whole thing. Um, and I wrote the book. Um, I would come home from my full-time reporter job, uh, put the baby to bed. He was like two, I guess, when he started, um, when I started writing it, two or three. And so I would put him to bed and then write for like an hour and then go to sleep and then wake up at four and write again and oh. then take him to daycare and then come back in the hour before I had to go to work and write, rinse, repeat. Um, so you can do this. It's not always easy or convenient. And I always say like, sleep when the baby sleeps, write when the baby sleeps. <laughs> Don't sleep. That's right. what I used to do. I used to write when the baby slept because it makes you crazy because you didn't get any sleep at didn't all. Didn't get any sleep. And it's so funny, I was on, I'm writing a second book. I was in Jamaica last week writing and I was also having day rum as I was writing. because. <laughs> As you do in Jamaica, that's As not one does. Yeah, like, and I go back and like so many typos. I wonder why, but um, I had to do something with my kid because we, he and the friends that we were with, we put our kids in like their camp during the day, so I could actually write. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so you do what you have to do. Um, and it's uh, anybody who says things like, just. It's just easy. It's not easy. It's terrible. It's, it's super hard, but you can do it. It's super hard, but you can do it. And I want to encourage you just because, first of all, don't tell, don't believe people who say you can't do it. And don't believe people who act like it's the easiest thing in the world. You can do it, but it's, you're on your deadline and your timeline, unless you have deadline with a publisher or something, but otherwise just write, you know, yes. look, somebody give you a heart. I love that. person. Oh, I love that. Right. <laughs> I used to write, I would be in the, checkout line at Publix in Florida and I would write things would come into my head and I would write in the notes mode of my iPhone as I was waiting in line. Awesome. Things I didn't want to forget. I just anything I could write on envelopes in traffic, there'd be an envelope or a bill or something sitting like mail and I would grab a pen and write it. You know, so my notes were a mess. Anyway, um, I am going to read my book is sad, funny. It's about death, but it's also funny. It's a funny death book. Um, <laughs> it truly is. Um, I wanted to read just a little bit. I actually, I'm going to time myself because as Christina knows, I can, I can go on if I want to. Um, I, so I, I'm going to time myself, but it's, uh, about the first weekend that my husband and I went away together before we got married. And the first time we loved each other, we told each other we loved each other. So here we go. Chapter is called try not to ruin a romantic weekend by throwing up too much. 
Um, about two years after Scott dies, I attend the Tampa edition of an annual international conference called Camp Widow. It's very much about widows, but not at all about camping because I don't ever camp. And as much as I want to heal, I never want to heal that bad. Camp Widow is where widowed people of every gender, race, age, and geographic location come to just be, to fall apart or share or help each other or laugh about dark widow shit that no one else gets. I meet a very wise widow named Tanya, whose firefighter fiance, Sergio, died in 9-11. And she tells me the most hopeful thing. At first, it destroyed her to think that her fiance would never make new memories. As she began to tell his story to those who didn't know him, to talk about things they did and who he was, uh, she realized that a whole new group of people had now introduced to him, that they now knew Sergio. She'll, he'll live out of those stories with those new people. Isn't that gorgeous? So in that spirit, here's the story of the first time I told Scott I loved him. It would eventually happen anyway, but happened to happen in an expensive room at the Mandarin Oriental in Miami. So it's extra cinematic. Uh, Scott won two nights in a hotel and a spa package in a silent auction at a celebrity dance competition in which I came in third. I was wearing neon green spandex situation along with a pair of Spanx that not only did not suck anything in, but pushed my fat up into an extra shiny shelf of even more fat. <laughs> it's true. Sequin neon fat. I have to find those photos. Okay. Dancing with the Spanx would prove to be significant for a few reasons. It was the first time Scott met my mom, who hadn't quite realized how serious we were. I've been playing my feelings so close to the vest that they were practically embroidered onto the vest. It was also the day Scott made it clear just how permanent his feelings for me were, announcing that he'd spent the day looking for an apartment close to me. So it was getting real, perhaps too real. At the time, Scott was bunking with his cousins in Boca about an hour away. I wasn't really interested in long-term dating someone who didn't have his own place. He was at my condo a lot, mostly chastely, because I was sticking to my celib celibacy guns. But I didn't want him living with me officially till we were married. That's partially due to my own convictions, but also because I didn't want to disappoint my family. They were several states away, so I could have just lied to them. But that would have created one of those sitcom situations where you forget who you lied to when. <laughs> and then your grandma's coming over while you're hiding a man in the shower. I don't have time to floss. I certainly didn't have time to keep track of all that. I now somewhat regret that much of the time Scott's been at my place. I didn't let him in all of his jerseys, very sports oriented, officially move in early because I was a grown woman who didn't like admitting she was still making major life choices based on other people's approval. Because I was previously bad at relationships, I was hesitant to accept that his residential plans had anything to do with me. So I was kind of a punk about it. Are you moving to be closer to me because of me or because that's where you want to live? I asked. Because of you, Scott said, matter of factly, then went back to whatever he was doing. What if we don't work out? I could have blown this. I know. Fortunately, Scott was not to be swayed by my rookie skittishness. We'll work out, he said, because he was such a confident guy such a go down with a ship sort, at least when it came to us. Sometimes it seemed foolhardy, but we all got to go down sometime, so it might as well be together. While we're on the subject, it's a good time to remind you that since we're all going to go down sometime, get as it gets sick and die, you should always listen to your doctors and take your prescribed medications. Just a note. Uh, right around the dance competition, Scott told me and his, my mom about an apartment he'd seen that afternoon at the part of, near the part, Port of Palm Beach maybe 15 minutes from me. It seemed like a nice older home and a possibility until the woman showing the place pointed to a painting on the wall. In my imagination, it was one of those haunted house portraits with the eyes that follow you like in Scooby-Doo. The woman was in the painting was the home's former owner who the friend said was right this minute haunting and watching over the place to make sure it was rented to the right person. Also, the eventual tenant was going to have to take care of the deceased cat Mr. Christmas, enjoy your house and haunted cat. <laughs> Are you going to go visit Scott if he takes that apartment? My mom said, oh, hell no. I said, planning on planning to talk him out of it. I did love him, though, so I'm sure that if he'd taken it, I'd have been over there with Mr. Christmas and the haunted painting soon enough. Love makes you do dumb shit. I looked at the, fo look at the photos of me at the dance competition now with my disco ball trophy Oh, yes. <laughs> that is literally a disco ball super glued into a trophy cup. 
and my lime green double fat, and it makes me laugh. The real prize with this man. I'd yet to cop to the last part, but it was coming soon. There you go. Oh, great. <laughs> and disco ball. I'm so happy I got to show you. I love that you have props and a PSA in your reading. Yeah. It's really impressive. You know, get it all in there. Yeah, as you can tell, Leslie's one of those people that if you sat with her for like 10 minutes, you'd just be like cackling the entire 10 oh. minutes. We had dinner in, in, in the Boston area and there was cackling and laughing. And I'm pretty sure the people at the dinner were like, what is happening? People in the restaurant were like, what is happening? <laughs> it was great. It was great. Well, thank you so much, Leslie. Thank oh, you. Amazing. Our next reader is Anne LeClaire. Um, before I introduce her, I just want to say, this is a woman who I met many years ago now, but she was like one of these like super women. Like, you know, people talk about like how to, you know, how they do things, but like she, she literally is like a pilot and she like runs every day and she meditates and she writes. I mean, she's got 10 books out. They're like bestsellers. I, I, I just don't, it just, when Tell I us your secrets, her, Anne. Not, <laughs> Seriously. But, and, and the thing is, is she's the most incredible person. Um, really just the most personable, fun-loving person. So I am really excited that she's here. Um, Anne LeClaire has written, of course, 10 novels, as well as her critically acclaimed memoir, Listening Below the Noise, The Transformative Power of Silence, and One Book for Children, a distinguished fellow at the Ragdale Foundation, the former op-ed columnist, now teaches creative writing workshops around the globe. LeClaire has been a visiting lecturer at Mount Holyoke College, the University of Tennessee, and Columbia College, and was featured was a featured presenter at Lincoln Center. She has two children, and she has chickens. <laughs> <laughs> So is this one of those moments like quit while you're ahead? I, I think so. Um, Leslie, I first of all, I want to say I covet your disco fall. Um, I'm now a competitive tango dancer and <gasps> I don't have a disco fall. Oh, wow. Um, I, I have two. I will send you one. I have I two. love that about you. Thank you. <laughs> I also want to say um, congratulations on having, you know, probably the second best ballpark in the country. And what's the, what's the first? <laughs> Need you even ask? Well, then I have to apologize because our Red Sox seem to be. Yeah, I knew that. Yeah, knew Sorry. That. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it was, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm so happy to be here with you tonight. Um, well, so my big decision was which what to read from. Part of me really wanted to read from the uh, nonfiction, the memoir, Listening Below the Noise, because it is about the power of taking silence and stepping away from the busyness of life, whether it's our schedules or the noise around us and how centering and crucial it is actually, and especially in this time. But then I really also wanted to read some novels and then I thought, I know what I want to read. I want to read from, this is not my latest novel, it's called The Halo Effect. And the reason that I would like to read it because you're either going to find this incredibly hopeful or go shoot yourself. Um, <laughs> it's The Halo Effect. And the story of this is my first slew of novels were just sold what I now look back and see was an incredible mixture of timing, luck, the right circumstances, the right editor landing on his or her desk. And so they sold pretty quickly and, and they sold well. And um, the last one before this that I wrote, I got a very handsome, this is another the good news and the bad news story. I got a very handsome advance for it, which was the good news. And the bad news was the book didn't earn out its advance and that goes on your record and publishers really don't like it when they paid you a slew of money and the book doesn't earn it. So I worked on the next novel and I just want to do a little aside here. Another reason I'm really glad at this moment that I chose this book is because I wrote a portion of it at the Virginia Center for Creative Arts oh. and Sandell, you were there at the same time. And each day at the end of the day, Sandell and I would meet in the gazebo and we'd read each other our work. So I feel it's fated that she's here tonight. Sandell, I'm so glad you're here. Oh, great. Because she had a part of this book. And um, I think it's better because of her feedback. 
And um, so I'm glad I, I chose this to, to read. See what happens when you come live? Beautiful things happen. Thank you for sharing that. So, so the good news was I got a lovely advance all along. And the bad news was that the last book didn't earn out. So I then went through the, uh, what felt like devastating at the time, uh, I wrote this book and then my agent had a really tough time selling it because they, the publishers look at your record and they care just about sales. Um, so I, at one time I was speaking early on when the book finally was published and I said it had, had 32 rejections and my author, my agent was in the audience and she said 35 and I said, oh, I have 32 and she said, I didn't tell you about them all. So it had 35 rejections and finally it was picked up by, and it was one of those wonderful things by an editor who so believed in it. She fought in house for it, she loved it and it became their number one bestseller. So don't pay attention to rejection. Oh, you can pay attention and go cry and suck your thumb and then wake up and go right. Don't pay attention to the rejections 10, 12 and 15. I mean, what was it? Motorcycle and the art of, uh, Art. Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Exactly. So it was rejected like 110 times. I mean, the oh. industry is legend with stories like that. So anyway, I would like to read the, the opening of, um, of um, The Halo Effect. Every day is ordinary until it isn't. On this early October morning, the townspeople in Port Fortune wake before dawn to an ordinary day with its ordinary sounds, the groaning of trawlers straining against lines in the mist-shrouded mist -shrouded harbor, the metallic chorus of gear being loaded on board, underscored by the fog-muted early morning conversation of men, the deep-throated trolling of the marker boy in the outer harbor. So sorry. Um, we're just going to have to annoy, uh, ignore the phone. Do you want me to turn it off and come back? If you wish, is I just had somebody come. I just had somebody come to the door, pounding on the door. So it's, I know it's how you bother you. It'll stop after two more rings. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, the the metallic chorus of gear being loaded on board, underscored by the fog muted early morning conversations of men, the deep throated trolling of the marker boy in the outer harbor, and over at Cape Port ice, the drone of the giant ice making machines. They wake too to the town's ordinary smells. At the dock, the distant miasma of salt, air, diesel fuel, ripe bait, and the mug up coffee. And at the loaves of the fisherman bakery on Prospect Street, the aroma of anise, cardamom, sugar, yeast, friolator oil, and cappuccino, scents so thick they nearly coat the air. These everyday noises and smells are not dissimilar to those you would find and her sister fishing ports along the Northeast coast. And yet somehow so particular to this place that a lost and sightless child could find her way home. At the police station, the shift changes and detective Don, Dan Gordon retrieves his service revolver from his locker where he has stored it since the birth of their daughter the year before. His wife insists on this precaution. Holly no longer wants a gun in the house not even though he swears it's always unloaded and secure in the small gun safe in the basement. He is not unsympathetic to her request. Even in this small town, he has seen the sorrow caused by weapons that are believed to be unloaded, not to mention the grief resulting from those deliberately loaded and fired in hot passion or cold foresight. At the Church of the Holy Apostles, Father Paul Gervais unlocks the front door and prepares for early mass amid the comforting aroma of incense, wax, and the oil soap Mrs. Mason uses on the worn oak floor. Not long ago, the church was kept unlocked, but a recent uptick in crime changed that. The local paper ran a series about the town's growing drug problem, particularly the oxycodone surge that has led to a heroin epidemic. The lead story for a week until it was crowded off the front page by reports about nearly a dozen girls at the local high school getting pregnant. The world is changing and no one knows that more than Father Gervais. He waits for the first parishioners to arrive, Italian and Portuguese women and widows for the most part, holding tight to the rituals of a lifetime, as if by this alone they can slow a world spinning beyond their control. At the loaves of the fishermen, Manny Costa, Leon Newell, 
and Cesar Amaro and Portuguese Joe arrive early. The four have spent a lifetime in coming in before dawn, rising, and although they no longer fish, the old habits die hard. At their regular table, they drink coffee, eat sweet rolls, and talk about the things that occupy their conversation every morning. The weather, town politics, how maybe the foreign fleets haven't completely killed the industry, but the restrictions of the new federal fishing regulations surely will. Gradually, the fog lifts and the sun inches upward, striating the horizon and casting a roseate glow over the eastern sky, the harbor and the ice house, the station, the bakery, other businesses and homes. Slowly, the rest of town awakens. On Chandler Street, Rain Labrie hears her brother revving the engine of the third hand piece of crap Mazda he thinks is such a big deal and curses him for not waiting to give her a ride to school. She texts her friend Lucy about how she will now have to take the bus like the dweebs do. There's no use complaining to her parents unless she's up to enduring yet one more lecture about how she should get up earlier if she wants Dwayne to give her a ride. Dwayne, her mother's golden boy, who in her eyes can do no harm. Across town at Governor Street, Sophie Light raps twice on her daughter's door. Lucy, are you up? She listens for a moment and reassured by the noises inside the room, she descends to the kitchen and crosses to where Will is pouring coffee into two mugs and brushes his cheek with her lips, smooths an unruly lock of hair with her fingers, a cowlick that spins in a counterclockwise direction that not even a calm and applications of health hair gel could tame. What time did you finally come to bed, she asks. Around midnight, the game went into overtime. He hands one of the mugs to her. Did I wake you? I was so wiped last night I wouldn't have moved if Hannibal and his irons bivouacked in the room. She takes a sip of coffee, smiles her thanks, so who won? Green Bay, is that good? Not for Chicago. He starts to say more, but at that moment he hears Lucy coming down the stairs. When their daughter enters the kitchen, his smile of anticipation morphs into a frown as he observes the snugness of her sweater, the length of her skirt, that in his mind should be illegal, then intercepts a look from Sophie, let it go. She has accused Will of being overprotective. Would you prefer she, what would you prefer she wear, a caftan? She recently asked him. Clearly she's better at handling their daughter's nascent sexuality than he, but doesn't she understand that a man's central purpose and desire is to protect those he loves? Now he looks at the contours of Lucy's breasts and her long thighs still tinged with the last of her summer tan. Their daughter is developing into a beauty on the cusp of womanhood, but it seems to Will she's remarkably innocent of the power this will give her. Yeah, a calf yet would suit him just fine. They eat what he has prepared, cold cereal with sliced banana. Sophie pours them a second cup of coffee. Lucy gulps OJ. They sit in a comfortable domestic silence broken only by the faint tapping of Lucy's thumbs on her iPhone, the digits moving faster than Will could possibly think you could do on a screen as miniature as that. If he's done this at the table, his father would have cut off his hands. He wishes they would ban those things, cell phones, social networking, Facebook, Twitter, ridiculous name, all the things pulling their daughter from him. He starts to speak, gets another look from Sophie, let it go. Then as if a switch has flipped, the morning ritual ends and there's a flurry signaling departure. Sophie grabs her briefcase at the door. She turns to ask, shall I stop on the way home and pick up dinner at the cottage kitchen? I've got it covered, Will says. Lucy kisses his cheek and he smells the banana of her breath inhales the apple-scented shampoo of her hair, the sweet fruitiness of her, and he knows a moment of fear and again the desire to protect her from danger, large or small. Bye, Da, she says in a voice still mourning husky. He nods his goodbye. He kisses Sophie, a lingering kiss that draws a mock sigh from Lucy across the room saying, hey, you guys, I'm still here, you know. But when he looks over at her, she's grinning. Then they're gone and he resumes the morning ritual wiping off the table, stacking dishes, turning off the coffee, already slipping into his own day, thinking now of the painting waiting upstairs on the easel, the supplies he'll need to order before the weekend. It's Tuesday, the day Sophie holds afternoon rehearsal for the chorus, and Lucy stays late for French club, then a field hockey scrimmage. Eight hours stretch before him, an ocean of quiet, so un with no husbandly or fatherly obligations, and he feels a fleeting twinge of guilt at the pleasure the idea of this brings him. An ordinary day in Fort Fortune, until it isn't, until Lucy Light doesn't come home.
Yikes. <laughs> and there's the hook. God, man. <laughs> I was going, oh, what a lovely way to set a scene in this beautiful family, typical thing. Bum, bum, bum. <laughs> I suspect you know a few things about bum, bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. That's so great. And I loved what you said before, and we're going to come back to that later. Um, so why don't we move on to our next reader, and then we can have our discussion. We are going to discuss everything, yes. including silence. Yes, including silence. Oxymoron. <laughs> our next reader, um, and we are so lucky to have him because he absolutely hates doing Zooms, but he was willing to do it for me and Melda. Yay, and Matt! We are so lucky tonight that you're actually seeing Matt Johnson. Matt Johnson! On Zoom. So Matt Johnson, as I said, is the recipient of the American Book Award, the United States um, Artist James Baldwin Fellowship, the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and the John Dos Passos Prize for Literature. Mm -hmm. Johnson is a regular commenter on NPR's Fresh Air. He is a professor, um, uh, and he's a Philip Knight Chair of the Humanities at University of Oregon, where he lives with his family. His long-awaited fifth novel, Invisible Things, which is incredible, <laughs> incredible, um, launches the end of this month, and you're going to really want to go out and get this. So, Matt, over to you. Thank you. Uh, Christina knows that I, uh, I'm, I'm allergic to Zoom, so, <laughs> it's just, you know. We thank I, you I, for coming. <laughs> well, I would of, of love to, to both you guys um, to come on. Plus, I this is the first promotional thing I've done for this book. The book's out in two weeks, and um, I am really, really rusty. Uh, on how to do stuff. So thank you for like putting Feel free up. to cut your teeth here. Yes. <laughs> the recording should be deleted, hopefully. It's over. Yeah, I was, it's funny. I was thinking of when you guys were talking both on the issue of like writing as a parent and on the issue of like the reality of the marketplace when, when you stumble, you know, and the writing on the parent thing, like I, I remember like the, my best strategy where I tell people with young children, um, I think I got my second novel done primarily with my daughter on a baby Bjorn on my chest. And um, because it was the only time I knew she would definitely stay asleep if I had yes. her on there. And I just would type around it. And, you know, I, I thought the description of it was, is great because it is not easy and it is also not impossible, right? And so it's like, you have to find that space between it because you can't beat yourself up if it doesn't happen. You know, you hopefully you'll, there's, if this isn't the time, there'll be another time where you can do it. But um, at the same time, if you can do it, uh, it's a great accomplishment, even just to be thinking about it and writing in smaller pieces. But, um, and then later, like my, the, you know, as my kids got older, my, my oldest is now um, just finished her sophomore year in college and my, um, my two younger twins just finished uh, uh, their junior year in high school. Um, but in the time since when they got bigger, a lot of the writing time that I found as a as an active parent was in um, basically like choosing every household chore or every duty that would actually also let me think um, and let me think about what was going on. So the dishes, folding clothes, like things like that, or you know, where I would go in to do the dishes and I'd be like, okay, by the time I'm done with these dishes, I want to have an idea about who, what this character wants, you know, little things like that. Nice. Um, that were a, like able to keep me in it. Um, that like, I, I think the fact that I kind of stayed in it and just didn't let it go cold, um, what turned out to be a, a, a really important part of how I kept writing. And it wasn't that like years went by where I didn't write a damn thing, but I was still like in it enough that when I was ready, it, I didn't come in like, completely cold. And by that, I don't mean I had everything out of my head. I just knew what questions to ask by the time I hit the page, you know, because the other part of it is you start playing on your head too much. It's stale uh, by the time you have sees it. Okay. So I will read um, again, Rusty. So this is a book about uh, basically 
when they, they go to the, the first NASA mission to uh, Jupiter's orbit, they are studying Europa, the moon Europa, and they discover a dome with an entire American city um, populated by everyone who's been kidnapped by aliens over the last four, 400 years. Ah. And um, the idea was kind of just to play with some of the things that are going on in, in, the, um, in the West outside of our immediate kind of uh, touchstones that everybody already has decided they know about. And um, it turned into this, basically this, this invisible thing story, which I didn't plan initially. Um, but you know, the best stuff is often the stuff you don't plan. So here's the intro of one of the characters, uh, the second character, the beginning of the second chapter, um, Chase Eubanks, who has a very specific uh, problem, uh, which you will hear about. It was freaking aliens, Chase declared, then sipped his pistol peats to give all the new faces at the meetup a chance to soak that in, soak in that wisdom. Near Valles Calderas, about 60 miles west of Santa Fe. That's right. I said it. I got no problem saying it. Now, does that statement make me look crazy? Sure. But that doesn't mean freaking aliens didn't steal my wife. That was when the chili cheese tater tots came out of the kitchen. Carnitas, the waitress asked him. Chase reached up like she might drop the plate. There were a lot of those, quote, unexplained phenomena interest groups in New Mexico, and Chase was a regular at most of them. But the Allies of Alien Abductees Sunday night meetup at Chase Abelitas, that was the gold standard. They had those private dining rooms. They had those pictures of Bud for five bucks. They turned tater tots into an art. Just two bucks more to get meat on top, and then it was a meal you could sleep on. There were a lot of UFO meetups to choose from. Some focused strictly on the military UAP stuff, all the verified footage of little Tic Tac ships or the long cigar shaped ones or the silent black triangles, et cetera, et cetera, each flying around at speeds and slants that would turn human passengers into applesauce. Lots of veterans of nuclear sites came as guest speakers at those clubs, coming to talk about the wild things they saw, trying to get the feds to disclose more. Some groups were all about that consciousness idea that you could communicate with the visitors if you meditated the right way. Other cliques were into the thing as a larger phenomenon, looking at portals and dimensions and poltergeists and whatnot. Freaky stuff that freak chase out just to think about it. And of course, there was the old school ufology scene with the whole mythology laying out the multiple alien species and a galactic tournament in which Earth was just one playing field. The meetings weren't just good. The meetings were important. Sometimes it was years between leaks of solid data. If you were interested in the topic, the best you could do was talk to like-minded others about what little you all knew. And sure, there was tons of UAP podcasting featuring UAP podcasters talking to other UAP podcasters, but it was always better to commune in person, looking one another in the eye while destroying a steaming plate of chili cheese tater tots. But for the abductee experiences, sweet Lord, that was a unique social situation. It was just different. All those believer camps, as varied and contentious as the members could be with one another, had one thing in common. Once you started talking about abductions, everyone got really uncomfortable real quick. All of a sudden, everyone was looking at you funny. You were either crazy or crazy for bringing it up. A uniformed four-star general could interrupt a sincere discussion about dogmen versus hybrid dinosaur pigs and reveal his abductee story, and everyone would look at him like he just crapped his pants. It was not a huge leap, at least for Chase, to go from believing there were alien craft flying around to believing they might pick somebody up. The UFO scene had all types of people with all types of beliefs, but once you told them you were experiencing your abduction, a lot of them figured you were either nuts or con artists, or they didn't believe it. And it made them majorly uncomfortable because it went against their pet theories, or simply because the idea that there were forces above that could snatch your ass whenever they wanted to, do whatever they wanted, to make you forget if they wanted, was some seriously fucked up shit. But not a trace, I believe. Always a nice crowd at the Allies of Alien Abductees meetup, and always all types of folks. People willing to open their minds. And professional types, not just kooks. Sometimes actual scientists would show up. Or tourists who flew into Albuquerque before driving north to Santa Fe. But tonight was special. 
because for the first time, Chase's boss, Harry Brenner, was finally in attendance. After a decade of declining invitations, here the old guy was, coming out to see what Albuquerque's finest unidentified phenomena scene was really about. Thank That's you. All. <laughs> There's a lot more, but awesome. <laughs> that was rusty. You start with it's freaking aliens. <laughs> that was hilarious and awesome. Thanks. You know what's pretty? Go back and like, why did I curse here? Why did I not curse there? And I really don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you could see, you could smell the tater remember. tots and like, oh yeah, yes, I love the chili tater tots. Yes, <gasps> definitely. So. I think that was written during the parts of the was the most of the book was done before the pandemic, but um, parts of it like that, I think were edited later, like during the height of the pandemic, where I was just like, you know, romanticizing going to a bar and ordering food, you know, like that was yes. like, 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 you know, an amazing thing. It's so true, true. So Matt, you are, you are zooming in from Portland, Oregon. Right, so it's like Dayton yeah, over by yeah. you. And where are you personal right now at this? Uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts. So you're in Cape Cod, and Leslie, you're in Baltimore right now. I am. I love this. Okay, very good. And Christine and I are in New York. So just for those of you out there, if you're worried about the lag, it's not our fault. It's the nation. It's a big place. So <laughs> you know, there's a lot of zooms going on now. But um, so. Um, Matt, you mentioned that um, this you hadn't written a book in a while. Was there a lot of pressure? Because I think that some authors feel pressure to produce a book every couple years. I don't know if you guys could talk about this. Yeah, I, you, you know, I've, it, it's been seven years since my last book. But honestly, like as I get older, time speeds up. So it doesn't feel like as long as some of the other stretches. Whereas I think between... My second and third one was about uh, eight years, and that felt like an eternity, you know, um, between the two. But yeah, I think there's pressure. I mean, honestly, at this point, I'm old. I got a good job. It doesn't really matter if I publish a book or not. It's not going to change my life. You know what I mean? And that's like, that was a big part of publishing in the beginning was like reaching for a different life. Um, you know, uh, one where I got to write for a living, one where, you know, I got to meet other writers and, and have interesting conversations. Um, and it's, so it's like the motivation for writing at this point has changed. Like, I'm not going to probably win a, a big, you know, like Pulitzer or anything at this point. I'm not going to most likely have a bestseller that's going to, you know, uh, upgrade my my car and, and make sure I never have to fly coach ever again. You know, <laughs> You could more do what Anne did and just learn to fly yourself. Yeah. <laughs> it's more just about like, um, I don't know, just feeling like I'm still engaged in this thing that I love. And I honestly, at this point, I don't think I, I know how to not write, I, really. Definitely. And Matt, you've never written, have you, do you write non, I mean, I know that you've published the, the graphic novel nonfiction, but you don't like write nonfiction. No, really, I do. I'm actually working on an article right now, but um, I did one book about the slave revolt in New York in 1741. Oh, wow. um, but that was that was, was that with incognito like while you were doing. Yeah, that's actually like when I first I, I was doing comics for the first time at the same time. And uh, but no, it's just like I'm not. I'm just not good at, at um, opening a, like with for memoir type work. I, I just I don't find my life interesting enough and I don't like opening it up for, for discussion. And so it's really hard. I'm supposed to be writing about my mother who, who passed away recently. And I, I just can't, I just, there's nothing I really feel compelled to share. Um, even though uh, I, I really love other people's work uh, where they explore uh, their lives. So it's just, you know, you don't get to be the writer you want to be. You just end up being the writer you are. Leslie, how did you end up writing about your most personal, most vivid grief. You know, it's so funny. I had written, I've been a columnist for a long time, but it was usually like funny stuff. I was a news, I was a movie critic and I would write about like going out with my friends and dating and stuff like that, or I would be married. So when sad stuff started happening, I really thought like, if I'm going to do this, I have to do it. I have to be authentic in it. So my dad died 10 years ago, uh, in a couple weeks and um i wrote about i wrote 
a, a tribute to him, gave it to my editor and he, at the Palm Beach Post, and he said, it feels like you're holding back. I'm like, of course I'm holding back. It's terrible. <laughs> and then I thought, if I'm going to do this, I have to do it. So I just let it rip. It was like one take. It was like Frank Sinatra, Crush the Clown, in, out, done. And he was like, this is brilliant. I was like, now I have to go cry. Um, so mm -hmm. when I when Scott died, I knew that I had to write about it. I wrote a column about it. And then I was like, I'm going to write this book. And it was a lot. It was like, Bleh, which is why editors are amazing. Get you a good editor because uh, editors can go. So that it, that's the other thing, too. And I wonder if any of those who because you talked, Matt, about the idea of not wanting to be open for discussion, even if you have something to say that you don't necessarily want to talk about it. And there's an idea of any writer, even if it's fiction, giving your work, your baby to someone to go nah! marking it in red. And when it's something that's so personal, you feel like, no, it's very hard. And it had to be a right fit, honestly. I found a good editor, but it had to be a little brown, but it had to be, she, she was a parent as well, and she got it. She's younger than me, but she got it. And I, I think that it's, you never know if the person is going to get it. And yeah, there was some things that she didn't get that she would, and she'd go, do, do, do. And I'd go, delete, 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 delete the red, the deep, delete. It's back, it's back. You know how that is. So yeah, all of it to say is that I wanted to be authentic and I wanted to write, like I said, the book that I didn't read. I wanted to read a book that was about the messiness of grief and the, the flailing of it and not, I have now survived this and here are my 10 tips and I'm very thin. <laughs> I mean, screw that. Nobody needs that. It's a lie. Anyway, so that, that's, that's why I did that. It's so interesting. <laughs> um, and do you have anything you'd like to comment on? I would like to comment about a, the push to do a book a year. Um, I myself have not paid any attention to that because I can't do a book a year. I mean, I don't even know how people do it. But I, there are people, and there are good people that do a book a year. But for me, Jennifer Probst, who's in the audience, does it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm a slow writer. I'm a careful writer, and I do. I love to do research. Um, sometimes to an extreme, just so I don't have to actually start the book. Um, but I think a lot about writers that I loved their first book, just loved their first books. And then they got into the of a book a year and, and gradually I felt like they were just writing the same book over and I'm not interested in doing that. Um, and I, I publishers seem to have this belief that if you don't get a book out every year, every year and a half, your readers will forget about you. And I think that's such a crazy idea. At least it seems so to me. Um, so the book a year thing, I, I have a real problem with it. That's absolutely <laughs> true because when there's an author, like if, if there's an author like a Matt Johnson who I like to read and I'm waiting, like I, mm -hmm. I get very excited that there's a next book, even if it's been four years or eight or how, like it's like, oh, oh, this author is writing a new book. I mean, it's, but it happens in every media, you know, when yeah. there's mm -hmm. a, director that you love or when there's a, like it's the artist. If there's an artist that you love, you don't care how long it takes. You want the next thing. Like, Well, they don't, they want one right away. Well, they well, do because they have to pay their rent. It's the, the people <laughs> who are doing the marketing. So it's like, you you always have like, and I, I used to cover music a lot. So you would have like a band, right? And they'd come up with a big thing and you could always sell like the filler thing in the middle. It was like B-sides or <laughs> things we found in the studio. <laughs> Because they were trying to like, or uh, the unreleased album that was crappy that they couldn't sell and now they're selling it. Or like, you would often find like, you would have actors like Julia Roberts, when she became famous, she had been in some movies no one had ever heard of. So they would repackage the DVDs or the, the VHS mm -hmm. things to have her. She was like in a half a scene or they'd have her face on the, the front of it, you know, <laughs> and they have to, to keep it going while they're making the next thing because they're also trying to get all the money. And that has, as you said, has nothing to do with art. It's nothing to do with how good it is. It's just about the the commerce part of it. Also, another thing that Matt touched on was like, I often think, so if I don't do another book, the world doesn't really have to have another book, but it's about the incentive that makes us right. Is it the pull of the story? Is it, and oftentimes when we start, it's like, this book is going to change my life. Everything is going to be wonderful from here on end because I will have published a book. And 
And you know how all through life we're kind of looking at a distant thing that's going to actually change our life. And for some, sometimes it's like if I get this job or I go to this school or I travel to this place or I meet a person that will bring me my life, my life, or I write a book and it's going to be turned into a movie or it's going to win this, even winning this prize, my life will be what I've always dreamt it's going to be. And the truth is, it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change one thing, except maybe a little more money in the bank or the people in town give you free coffee or something. I mean, it doesn't change anything. And I remember hearing Matt Damon talk about winning the Academy Award when he was in his 20s and holding it and going home that night thinking, I'm really, really glad I won this at this time in my life because I think about all the people that spend their life just making poor decisions to get this award, choosing parts they think are going to bring them this award. And then maybe they're in their 70s and they get the award and they think this, this was it. This is what I spent my life working toward for this. It, it, I know it's, it's, it's kind of an American thing too, I think, about this one thing is going to change our life. This one success, this one dream fulfilled, and I will be all I was meant to be. And I can tell you that no matter how a book does, does well or not, what readers say, what reviewers say, it doesn't change your life. It really doesn't. That should be very liberating to people, I would think, to like... I mean, to let go of the, this one thing will change my life and realize that you're already the person you're going to be. So you it's can write. Thing, but it's write. also like scary because it's it. then, well, why do I write? And that's that's the tough question to face. Let's ask, it's why do we write? Thing. Matt Johnson write? and what, what, why do you write? Why do you write? You've already done all the writing, you've done all the things. <laughs> why do you write? What made you write this book, Matt Johnson? Damn, I mean, that's, that's hard. I think... Um, I think it gives it gives me a sense of meaning, you know. Yeah. I'm not a religious person. Um, I'm not an anti-religious person, but I'm not a religious person. And I, I think it means something as far as like making the most of my life. Like I see a lot of my friends questioning their careers at this point. I'm 51, going on 52, and um, a lot of people quitting their careers to do new ones. Um, a lot of people looking and say, what have I done with my life? And um, I, I don't, that's one thing I don't have. Like I, I look and say, okay, I did, you know, there's some other things I wish I could have done. There was some, I wish I had more time to do other things. Like I'm doing more TV stuff. You're right, you only have what, 40 years left? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like, you know what though? I feel like your writer life starts for me, like when you start really producing, whether it's publishing or writing with the stuff that isn't getting picked up. And then that writer life, last for as long as it's going to last and and then that writer life um you might run out of juice like i think i'm going to run out of juice but know. you know i have other i have students who start in their 60s who have way more like you know passion and everything going in than i do you know uh, a decade before so and yeah i think it's just a sense of meaning you know that um that i didn't waste uh my life and that you know for all the things that my parents went through to bring me into this world my mother did raising me that it's kind of out of respect to that um that i've been created but i you know I, I i'm also fine for not writing i'm planning on not writing at some point and and just doing other things you know because the other part Inspiring of it is respecting other life people in general so you're not, yeah yeah i recommend dancing that really <laughs> tango <laughs> dancing tango. I'd like to, to speak to that too, because yes, why why do we write? Um, I write because from as soon as I could put, understand the words of the page, I've been a reader. I, I'm, you know, I love to read. So I am completely seduced by story. And so I have an idea and I want to tell the story. So I think I'm writing because I just want to tell the story in my head and get it on the paper. And it's only when I'm done that I'm done that I look at it because I'm always like the last to know oh, I was really writing this because it's something I want to know about, understand about life, understand about people. But I don't go in going, I'm going to write a book that will explain, oh, like Leslie says, about grief or about loss or about forgiveness or about, you know, huge loss, about betrayal. I don't go in with themes. I go in like this story. I've got a, this woman's story, this man's story, this couple's stories. I have to, this story. I write it because I want to find out how it's going to turn out. 
Mm. And when I'm done, I find, no, I was really, really writing because on some deep level, there were things I was trying to understand about life. Mm-hmm. What about you, Leslie? You're super journalist, super essayist. What, what? You know, I don't know how to, to, I don't know how to do anything else. And I know that that sounds like, <laughs> oh, like self-deprecating, whatever. I literally don't know how to do any deals. I've always written, like when I was younger and I had to do a project, other people were like making, you know, scenes out of, you know, matchbook cars and toy soldiers and stuff. I was like, I'll write a play. And this was like in the 80s, like before I had a computer, a long hand, and I would mess up and try to, you know, liquid paper it and start, <laughs> you know. So I, I've always written, I've always been, that's both been it, as a hustle and also <laughs> as a career. Um, I wrote in my column this morning for the Baltimore Banner about having a columnist, Michael Olesker, formerly the Baltimore Sun, came to my high school, of which he is a graduate, Baltimore City College High School, and talked about being a columnist. I said, they pay you to do that? I want to do that. And so uh, that's always just sort of been how I've expressed myself. And I am fortunate enough to also be a person that got paid, gets paid to do it. And um, in many forms now, I've found that, you know, I've written a couple plays now and I, you know, written this book and I'm writing another book and I'm writing the columns and I can do a bunch of different things. And I guess I wrote this book because it was like a weight I needed to get off my chest. It was like the pain was so visceral and so real it felt i've written like it was like an elephant stepping on my chest and i just needed to push the elephant off i needed to get the words out of my chest and then it became i need people like i said to re i would like to provide a thing that i did not have that was a non-glib book and also i didn't want it to be like i'm not there were a lot of books that were like i'm not a typical widow i'm a cool widow look at me (laughs) and drink my drink i'm Cool. I'm like, I am a mess and I'm watching a lot of John Wick and I'm drinking too much bourbon and I, I can't bring myself to tell my son to say the words dead to my son who was a baby and didn't get it. And I was a big giant mess and I wrote my way through it. So that's that's why I, I write because I can't I have to because I like to eat and that if I have a mortgage to pay. I'm and super curious if you write better now that you have a kid or like like to write like because you write your stuff is very voicey and funny and like very sharp and kind of do you find that being a mother softens that or you want to soften or is it more like i cannot wait to be myself where i think no myself can hear me <laughs> myself at 51 is different from myself at 22 when i started um writing newspaper stuff so i think i'm a better writer because even without the parent thing i think i'm a better writer because I'm not so impressed with myself. You know, mm. like when you're 22 and you go, I am endlessly funny and witty and whatever. And this idea I have, no one else ever had it. <laughs> ever. <laughs> so you know, funny. you know what that is. And I look back and it's very embarrassing to read your like beginning writing, go, oh my God, why didn't no one tell me that I suck? <laughs> but I, we all suck too, I guess. Everyone did. But I think that he has we call made, that holding promise. We don't call that sucking. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I, I think that he has made me, first of all, I have to be a lot more deliberate about when I write and how I write because I don't have as much time as I used to. And I think that I take myself a lot less seriously. I'm not trying to like, as a journalist, um, when I first started doing celebrity, celebrity review, um, interviews, I would try to do that like, um, Chris Farley show thing, I'm dating myself on the SNL when he would like ask st- stupid questions like, remember you were in the Beatles? That was really cool, you know? <laughs> like, and so I, there were all these, like I grew up in the Rolling Stone era where everyone was like, I'm gonna ask that question that no one else has asked. It's gonna be super cool. And it was usually stupid because there was nowhere to go. It wasn't a conversation. It was just to look how cool I am. And those interviews would crash and burn. And so I've learned that I don't have to be cool. I just have to be good. And it has to mean something to the readers. Nice. And so that, that's, that's what it is. But, you know, just to append to that, I mean, can you even imagine doing anything else? I mean, how crazy that even the idea of doing something else, would that just makes no sense. I think that most writers feel that way. 
I want to ask Anne about this silence thing, because I'm, I'm sure that you've talked about it to endless endlessness. Uh, but I'm sorry, I read that you are silent once a week on a I Monday. actually witnessed this. I would like to hear about why in the world did you do this and how in the world do you maintain it? And then you can also tell us why it's awesome. But I'm super curious. It was not my intent to, to, to practice silence or um, I was like the kid on the report card it always says Anne's talks too much in class. <laughs> so it was it didn't come naturally, but at a time of a loss in my life and a, a friend's loss, I was January on Cape Cod walking on the beach and just feeling very um, open, broken open by sadness. And Leslie, you know that feeling, right? And which is the gift. I mean, for us, uh, grief doesn't break our heart in half, it breaks it open. I'm busy, sorry. So any, anyway, um, uh, sorry. So on that moment, I was watching some Ida ducks dive and stuff and trying to pattern my breath while they're underwater. And I got very quiet and I just suddenly was overcome with gratitude for all the beauty and privilege of our lives. Just why we don't walk around on our knees every day for the privilege of being alive, whatever is going on. And I thought, I'm so grateful. I don't know what to do. And I heard a voice behind me say, sit in silence. And it wasn't in my head, it was behind me. And it was I like a person, like a, a, a yeah. thing, a sound? Yeah. Was it a physical person or was it just a sound? No. It was just Wow, so some, okay. So, but it just like, freaked me, so I'm walking on sit in silence, what's that mean, sit in silence? And I thought maybe it means be quiet. So I went home and said to my husband, I'm not gonna talk tomorrow. And um, he kind of like negotiated, like, <laughs> what if the kids need you? What if Margaret's mother dies? What if this, what if that? But the things that always pull us from the what ifs yes. too often, you know. So the next day, I started in silence. I said, I don't know, maybe I can't do it, but I'm going to try. And interestingly enough, two different people, a friend of his and a friend of mine, when I told them, and he told what we were doing, I was doing, they said, That's wow, how radical. And since both had used the word radical, I went and looked it up and found that the root of it is radicalis, meaning getting to the center, getting to the truth of things, getting to the center. So I Late, much later, years later, I thought that was so interesting because silence brings us to the truth. So at the next day, all I can tell you was it was one of the best days. It was, um, it was like that kind of Buddhist practice, like when I was making oatmeal, I was making oatmeal. I wasn't distracted uh, by phones or conversation or my brain, it slowed everything down. And in the evening I was so relaxed and rested. My writing that day just flew. And I thought I want to do this again. So I decided to do it two weeks later. It's not every Monday, it's every other Monday, the first and third Monday. So this is the 30th year I've been doing that. And oh my god, what? It <laughs> but if you if you and sometimes like I've I've gone and done lectures or workshops on it, people go, I could never do that. And it's true, some people their life circumstances or whatever, they can't, but you can do an hour, you can do a half day, you could do 20 minutes before bed, 20 minutes on waking take a walk at lunch. And it taught me almost more than anything in my life. It taught me how to listen to myself. I'm an interrupter, or I was, I'm a recovering interrupter. So on a silent day, if I was with people or like with Christina or something in an artist colony, someone would be talking and I'd want to like put in my two cents, you know, or I'd be at the post office and someone would come in and go, I'm looking for this address. The post office would be telling them, I want to go, no, you know what, the best way to do that, they weren't even asking me. <laughs> so it taught me a lot about my own habits, my own inclinations, my own prejudices. I mean, when you're not able to speak, you listen to yourself. And when you listen to yourself, you find out who you are. So I found myself listening to others. I found myself experiencing, one time I was at that Virginia Center and it was dinner time and there were 24 artists in residence and it was someone's birthday. And everyone started singing happy birthday, but I couldn't because I was in silence. And all of a sudden I was overwhelmed with feeling like the outsider, the other. Um, and no one else was even paying any attention. They, they, would, would, they didn't even know if I was singing or not, but I felt like I was outside the group. And it was very painful, although it was all in my head. I went for a walk after dinner and I thought, oh, that's how it feels. That was, that's how it feels to be excluded. That's how it feels to be the other. That's how it feels to be separate. 
you know this feeling now in your gut, you have to make it your intention to never intentionally ever make someone feel like the other and excluded, the outsider, different, because now you really know on a simple thing like just not being able to say happy birthday, what it feels like. So it helped with relationships, it helped with family, it helped me know myself, it helped me with nature. I mean, just, you remember the first days or the first weeks and months of COVID, everyone was saying, oh, it's so nice not to have to be running everywhere. I love that my calendar's quieter. And we don't allow that in our culture particularly. You know, there's so, busyness is a kind of noise. So anyway, I'm, I, I won't take up any more time, but I, it just changed my life in every way imaginable. So Actually, I, I wanted to say, um, and you know, it's so funny because I remember I was at a colony with um, Anne many years ago, and I was suffering from writer's block, like, like the worst kind, the kind that like you just want to climb up the wall. And I remember, I remember you, um, you had a night of silence, and it was because I was going nuts in my mind because I could hear everyone working around me. And we get to dinner and you were the only one who was listening and <laughs> silent. And I just thought it was so incredible. It was really, I, I really felt like you were aware. And that was such a great thing. It was so amazing. It really made a difference. Yeah. I and think we, that would have gone ban bananas if it hadn't been for you. No one trains us how to listen. Yeah. <laughs> it's like conversation in our culture is talking and waiting to talk. Yeah. Or not waiting, just jumping <laughs> in. <laughs> Sorry. Can I answer a question? There was a question for me that was <laughs> when I was reading. Yeah. Somebody asked, someone asked if, if Marvel had come after me for the for Oh, the right. Title, that was Laura. Uh -huh. Which I thought was hilarious. So obviously, I asked my editors and my publisher do you think that this is gonna be a problem they said first of all i don't think they've ever heard of it at this point but also i wish it had been huge enough that they would have been what is this book but, um <laughs> i did for a while use the hashtag not scarlett johansson um that's funny but, but we figured because the term black widow obviously is a term that predates the Marvel character. It's a spider. It's, it's a spider. And also <laughs> there's the idea of being a black widow who like kills people, but mm -hmm. also I'm literally black widow. So that's what the reference was. Cause it, that's why it's funny. Yes. Yeah, so I figured like I said, it would become huge. I mean, we, we like, you know, we're still working on having another forms. So um, we optioned it and we're figuring out what's going on with it, but I don't know if it would be called this. That's that's when Marvel might be involved. Once again, I hope that I make enough money that they go, "How dare you!" And there's a big fight. No, um, <laughs> but no, no. So far, I don't think Marvel has even heard of me, and so I don't think that it is um, has been a problem. But I thought that was a really great question. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so, just about the craft, just for one more minute, um, because we're almost getting on E15, and we ha we have barely enough time. So. All of you are seasoned writers, and when you come up with ideas that are, and Anne, you touched on this, when you come up with ideas that feel, that you feel passionately about, enough to write a whole novel, like how, how do you actually come up with ideas that are so different from the other novels that you write? I don't come up with them. They come to, sometimes I have a dream. I mean, two novels came out of a dream. Sometimes it's a headline I read in the paper and I go, oh, what if? Or I turn, you know, it intrigues me. Like one of the books was about love, love found hearts. It was about, and I read a newspaper, it was on the front page of the New York Times about two sisters, um, in, actually from Massachusetts. And I can still remember what they looked like in the picture. And one needed a, one needed a kidney and her sister gave her the kidney. And I remember reading it and thinking, what if your sister needed a kidney and you were estranged? And that just, I just like, oh, I want to write about this. I want, it, it intrigued me immediately. Family dynamics, what are we, family responsibilities to each other? Uh, I'm keeping a kidney. Of, what? I'm keeping my kidney. <laughs> <laughs> I had said to my sister at the time, I said, if I needed a kidney, 
would you want to give me one? And she said, absolutely. And I said, well, you better hope that, that I'm the one that needs the kidney and not you, because I'm not so sure where I'm landed on this one. <laughs> Matt, how about you? Uh, um, yeah, I, I think I start with the question sometime, but I, I don't even know. Like I'm working on a new one and I just liked a voice and uh, like it, it was an obnoxious writer voice. And I just kind of let that go and then see where it went. But honestly, I don't think I have a set way. I, there's been times where I've had a sentence that I think I love the sentence. This is a first line for a book and I don't know what the book's about. And then I'll go from there. And there's other times I've started with a question, um, wanting to explore, you know, certain questions. And, um, and other times, just because like something was in, basically like an earworm. And, you know, like I wrote a book that had to do with Poe because I was reading Poe and, oh, you know, cool. got up in my head and I, you know, and that's, that's how it came. I wish, I don't know how to come up with a successful story, but I do like to think that I want to find something that I want to write about that other people actually want to read. And if we can get that crossover, then it seems like it, you know, it's worth putting energy into it. Awesome. Leslie, how about you? I'd say, Matt, I am from the city, the only city nerdy enough to name its football team after a Poe poem, because that's what we do. <laughs> Tell me, roll. literally on the way to jury duty today, there is a building that's a fancy, one of those apartment buildings that used to be a historic building. It's called the Lenore, and there's a little yeah. raven. Because oh, no, really? once yeah. again, we're dorks. Our, the, our um, mascot's name is Poe. That's just mm -hmm. that's the dorky city that I live in. But anyway, um, I'm new to writing books. I used to like start books and not finish them. And this book, the memoir, I felt I had to write it like it was the thing that was literally on my chest. But lately I'm sort of simultaneously writing two novels. There's one I'm really focused on, but there's one I've started. The first one was based on a, play, a screenplay that I wrote literally longhand 30 years ago in a notebook that no one ever saw but me. And so I wrote about those characters were 30 years older. And so it's a sequel to me, but no one else knows it. Nice. And the one that I'm writing now, I don't want to say what it's about, but it's basically, it's based on a, an interview I did with someone that was about a television show that I was recapping. And it was something happened on the show that was so wild where I thought, what if that situation happened, but it was different and if it involved, say, a 45 year old black person. So, um, cause that's sort of where my, where I, you know, I'm not super adventurous. I'm not writing. I, I write, I can write about people that are different than me, but not enough people are writing about like weird pop culture obsessed 45 year old black women. So I will be that person. I will write that person. <laughs> We're happy to read it. There go. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Can I follow up on this question with a totally different question, um, but also similar. Um, think back to your first published piece, that very first time that you were published, like actually published, what inspired you to write that piece? Leslie, you can go first since you were laughing. <laughs> One of the first things I wrote, it was maybe the second thing I wrote, or second or third, it was in the high school newspaper, The Collegian at Baltimore City College High School. And it was a capsule review of songs that I liked, the things that just came out. And it was Howard Jones's No One Is To Blame. And I literally- <laughs> No, it's with, stuck in my head. Thank I you. I literally, sorry, <laughs> without irony said, this is the greatest song ever <laughs> written. And I talked about like, cause it was 1986, what did I know? And I wrote about like the Phil Collins backup, still brilliant by the way. <laughs> the, you're the fastest runner and you're not allowed to win. It's like, Phil, speaking to me. <laughs> so um, that was the first thing I, I think I wrote something about like the campus cleanup and that's the first thing I felt in my soul. Yes. I think I also reviewed a Mr. Mr. album. It was 1986. It. Put your foot in the pool, but you can't have a swim. Oh, <laughs> I, I had no idea what it was about. It's about not wanting to cheat. I had no idea what it was about because I was 14. I was like, but Phil is about not being Howard. Yeah. I was so dumb. I, I think there could be a whole book on misinterpretations of songs by teenagers. <laughs> like just what you thought the song was about versus what it actually was. In my 20s, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Like, no, it isn't. No, it isn't. That's not what it's about. Uh -uh. I know. So dumb. But yeah, that's what it was. What about you, Matt? First published piece. What sourced that first? First, first published piece was, a, I was about um, 
uh, what you call it, Janet Jackson's music video for, um, um, Look at this. I can't remember the one the Joni Mitchell remixed uh, song. Um, uh, uh, do, uh, the, we, with the, um, uh, that, yeah, exactly. The go yeah, I wrote about it for the Amsterdam News, and, and I, I just still, that's still like my favorite music video of all time. I just was tweeting about it the other day. And uh, I wrote this like ecstatic, you know, one page thing. And I remember walking um, down the street through Columbus Circle, and I carried the Amsterdam News and like picking it up. I, I wanted to pick it up and like see my name on the paper, like right there, like in the movies. And uh, yeah. I'm glad I did because you know, Pritt died not long after, so. It was <laughs> That's a good thing, you had it, you had it. <laughs> the newsprint on your fingers. And what about you, your very first published something? Oh God, oh, um, uh, <laughs> I think it was, I was 15. Well done was, you. Uh, about Christmas time around there. So, you know, Christmas time, so the Christ child's everywhere, people, there's in front of churches, all, and I kept thinking that, Frankincense, myrrh, gold, and as well as a 15 year old could possibly imagine, I imagined some future where I had a, a son and thought, what gifts would you like to give him? So I just wrote a thing that was a little wacky and wild about, as well as I could imagine at that, at 15. And um, I sent it thinking maybe they'd print it in the off ed page, I mean, in the letters to the editor or something. I don't, I don't even know what possessed me, actually, except maybe arrogance or something. I don't know. <laughs> And uh, it was on the front page of the paper. Uh, oh, and wow. I just like, that's kind of heady. And, um, you know, I liked that. But, and then I guess um, that was like school papers and stuff. And then in college, some stuff. And that it was like, I don't know. I would just send things, I would just send things off and not worry. But that was the first one. That's gorgeous. Well, my friends, I am so sorry to tell you that we are again over time as usual. It is summer, so guess what? This was a pop-up salon. We're not even supposed to be doing salons in June, and yet here we are doing them. So you could, you know, send us a donation. That would not suck. And, uh, you know, just sort of gratitude. Um, but I want to personally thank Matt and Anne and uh, Leslie for your wonderful stories, your wonderful time for coming on a Zoom at all, because who likes them? Nobody, but it allows us to have a much greater reach. And Pen Parentis is a nonprofit and we do help writers stay on creative track after they have kids. And we do these salons on the second Tuesday of every month from September through May. So we will see you again in September. On September 14th, we have a great lineup for you. Uh, we will buy, be spending the summer choosing our Pen Parentis Writing Fellow, but the fellowship is already closed, but we are very excited to be picking a winner. And then, of course, our meetups are running all through summer. And we now have, I think, 10 of them. And we're starting to, to talk about doing some in person. So if what you need and want is an accountability group to which actually cares whether or not you fin they finish your work, you finish your work, or whether you write at all, if you want that, we have that. So come over to penprentice.org, check us out. If you're interested, become a title member. We could use your support. And thanks again um, to Matt, Leslie, and Anne, and of course, Christina, and Thank to you all guys. of you for watching and our playback people for watching. And buy their books, buy their and, books, guys. Yes, We're gonna love reading them on the beach. Bye.